Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel, and thanks for logging on. Today, we have a matchup of two timepieces that you might encounter on the pre-owned watch market. They're rough equivalents in terms of style, substance, and utility, but worlds apart in detail. This is a matchup of the Patek Philippe Aquanaut 5167A and the Vacheron Constantin Overseas Auto Generation 2. These two timepieces are going head to head. We're going to go with the VC first. Patek is the power in this segment, we're going with the Challenger. Now this is a timepiece that was based on the 2004 second generation overseas auto, but the specific combination you see here with the titanium bezel and the steel case and the rubber strap, sometimes nicknamed the Deep Stream, this came out in 2009. Throwing it on the wrist, you can see that the overseas auto is an easy watch to wear. Though it is 42 millimeters to the 40 of the Aquanaut, it feels more organic on the wrist, that is the ergonomic element, how it matches the machine to the man, seems more natural to me. The timepiece is not nearly as thin as the Aquanaut, but it is slim. At only 9.8 millimeters thick with a sloped bezel, you will slide this one underneath the shirt cuff, and I experimented with the shirt you see here, no problems. 42 millimeters in diameter, but it's more of a cushion case profile, and the most pronounced dimension is gonna be the lug to lug, which for this watch is 50.1 millimeters, but it's an easy 50.1. As you can see, the case itself has a little bit of camber. It curves and arcs down around the wrist. Now the timepiece, we're gonna polish it up to make it look a little bit spiffier for the video, but the timepiece has a genuine curve to it, almost like a Richard Mille case, but it's late and dramatic at the edge of the lugs. The strap itself is a handsome piece. It's the same perfect conforming taper you would get from a bracelet, so the lines of the watch as well as the unitary coherence are preserved. Underneath you can see large striations that reduce the material and make it more pliant, while also giving the wrist an opportunity to breathe. Now here's an important point of distinction. This is a double deployment clasp with trigger actuation, and you can see it's a standard sizing mechanism. You do have a screw to fix it in place once it's sized to make it just a little bit more secure, but compare that to the situation with the Aquanaut. You have a handsome clasp, it's a good looking piece, no doubt, but you'll also note that this is a strap that's designed to be cut, so you need to commit to one size and then stick with it. A lot of folks hate cutting straps and just having to buy a new strap every time you need to resize is a considerable imposition on the owner. Now the timepiece features wonderful comfort on the wrist as well as the security of a twin trigger system. Recurring motif, the Maltese cross symbol that is the signature of the brand. I will mention that the case itself is strong but simple. It has a large 70s inspired cushion form that traces its roots back to the reference 222 of 1977. That was a Jorg Heisick design. The overseas has generally been a work of Vincent Kaufman within Vacheron's design studio. You can see there's a transitional bevel between the shear of the case and the hoods of the lugs, and there's a satin finish on the hoods of the lugs as well as the hood of the case. There is a matte finish for the titanium of the Maltese cross motif bezel, and it's a nice match to the sunburst anthracite gray of the dial itself. White gold quarter arabics, there's a dished ray hot outboard, and gray oxidized hands that trace the 360 degrees of the dial with an off-centered date display window. Now it doesn't take up one of the indices, it doesn't replace one of the numerals, and you can see that's a clear point of distinction between the two watches in terms of dial design. Underneath the case back, bearing the image of the Italian naval training vessel Amerigo Vespucci, there is a solid soft iron cage that endows the watch with robust 25,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetism, 150 meters water resistant, and it is a Vacheron 1126 movement. This is a JLC 899, automatic winding 38 hour power reserve, 32 joules, free sprung, Ceramic rotor bearings, unidirectional winding, hacking seconds with a quick set date, adjusted in six positions, very precise, and it has the potential to run way beyond chronometer specification. So this is a, a tough, slim, high horology movement from a company that has a long history of working with Vacheron Constantin. For years, JLC actually administered Vacheron and owned the majority of the company. Now, jumping over to a watch that debuted back in 2007. This is the Aquanaut. The timepiece, of course, of the Aquanaut family launched in 1997, revived as the 5167 you see here for, for 2007, and this is actually the latest variant of the watch that features six position adjustment and a silicon hairspring, so there have been some tech updates, but for the most part, the watch is an ergonomic and technical match for the timepiece that bowed back in 2007. It's 40 millimeters in diameter, so considerably smaller than the Vacheron, and it measures a svelte 
8.2 millimeters thick, so this is a really easy one to wear underneath the dress cuff. If you must wear one of these with formal cuffs and you have any doubts, I don't think either watch would have any trouble, but for absolute elegance, this is the choice. Lug to lug, 47 millimeters, 21 millimeters is the lug spacing, and you will note that you have some leeway here to fit an aftermarket strap if you desire, since the Vacheron uses a proprietary junction system, but on the other hand, the Vacheron also uses screws to fix the strap in place, so it's a bit more secure. Most folks will never report problems with spring bars, but still, that's one feather in the Vacheron's cap. Slim case band, simple design, less going on here than the more overtly 70s inspired Vacheron. The presence of true lugs sets the Aquanaut apart from both the Vacheron as well as its segment rivals the Royal Oaks and in-house competition from the Nautilus. True lugs distinguish an Aquanaut. The dial is a silvery gradient, black outboard, argent silver at the center, and you can see it has a geosphere cut that matches the embossed pattern of the strap. All applique white gold to Arabic numerals with the exception of three o'clock, white gold hands at center, and a counterweighted lancet style seconds hand. Now the watch does feature a display case back. We will get as close as we can and try to honor one of the standout features and competitive advantages of this watch. You can see the movement is handsome. Caliber 324 SC, adjusted in six positions, free sprung gyro max balance, unidirectional winding with ceramic bearings, 35 to 45 hour power reserve, screw down crown 120 meter water resistance, and this is true Geneva seal levels of finish. Now you can see the Patek Philippe seal blazon, as it has been since mid-2009, there has been no loss of quality. It's the same immaculate standard of execution, right down to the polished pilots at the bottom of the stalks of the screws. These are expensive screws. I'll also mention that it is a beautiful caliber inherently, as it doesn't hide nearly as much as a conventional automatic. It does feature a quick set date. It does not feature hacking seconds. Beating away at 28,800 vibrations per hour, like the Vash run, it has a silicon hairspring, and the Patek Philippe seal is an attestation, not just of quality and finish, but of precision. Minus three, plus two per 24 hours or better. Okay, let's score this one. In its favor, the Vacheron has a lot going on. First, absolute value. There's no contest. This is a watch that sold for $13,000 when it was new, and it hasn't been on the market since 2015. Today, they're pre-owned between $10,000 and $11,000, which means this is easily the choice if you're looking to maximize your dollars. Right now, this watch sells for about 39% of the high end of 5167 production, or cost, I should say. So you could pay 28,000 for a 5167 pre-owned. This timepiece, about 11 grand, worst case scenario. Also, superior strap. The strap is just better on the wrist. It has more hollows on the underside to vent the wrist, and it has a clasp that allows you to quickly and easily size it using nothing but a screwdriver. You don't have to cut, you don't have to permanently alter the strap in any way, so it has convenience on its side. The clasp itself feels more substantial than that on the Patek Philippe, and it's also more handsome. Some of the details are just a little bit superior. In this respect, advantage Vacheron. Now, the timepiece does have more wrist presence. 42 millimeters in diameter, 50 millimeters lug to lug, and 9.8 millimeters thick. It does have almost a mini offshore character to it. It's competitive with the current Audemars Piguet 15400s, and yeah, it'll hold a candle to the 42 millimeter offshore. It has more wrist presence even than a Patek 5990. I'll also mention that it's just objectively more comfortable with the cushion profile, broad case back, curved lugs, and that superior strap and clasp combination. This is the one that's easy to wear on your wrist for longer. I'll also mention that it has some tech advantages with a hacking seconds function, as well as 150 meter to 120 meter water resistance for wrist presence, value, and a few details on its side, as well as a somewhat less speculative character as a purchase, that's what the Vash Run has going for it. Now, the timepiece that also shares the spotlight is the unquestioned leader, not in wrist presence, but in status and prestige. It's not as big and overt as the Vacheron, but Patek Philippe, and especially Patek Philippe sports watches and steel, offer a matchless prestige at this moment. They're practically tradable commodities too, as investment vehicles hard to match. This watch sells new for $18,940, and it sells pre-owned for $26,000 to $28,000. So this is a timepiece that actually gains a little bit of value, a lot of bit of value, as a matter of fact, out of the dealer's case at this moment moment in time. This is a timepiece that is thinner, and considerably so. It has a more elegant case band. The full and 
graceful arc of the lugs gave the watch less of a squat appearance than the 70s inspired Vacheron. It's still sold new, so if you want to buy one of these watches new, this is the easy choice and the only choice. You're going to have to buy a Generation 3 Vacheron. You can't get the G2 anymore. Also, display case back and finish, for which the Vacheron just has no answer. Sure, the Vacheron has a bit more anti-magnetism. Sure, it's a bit more water resistant. And yes, the image of the sailing ship is graceful, but this is the business, and this is that for which watch and enthusiasts pay premiums. I'll also mention that this timepiece has better loom. So from a pure time-telling perspective, I'm not going to give one the advantage by day, although I am leaning Patek, but this one definitely has the edge by night. You guys let me know in the text box below which one you prefer, but on the basis of value, love for the brand, the fact that it is JLC powered, and a few technical refinements that I happen to favor personally, as well as the virtuosity of this strap compared to the paddock, this is the one I would choose, but there really is no wrong answer here. Of all the versus comparisons that I've filmed, this is probably the closest finish, a dead heat. Let me know which one you would choose in the comments below. Patek Philippe Aquanaut versus Generation 2 Vacheron Constantin Overseas Automatic. I'm going with the Aquanaut on this one, but only for the loom shot.